By the way, we haven't really touched on the DeFi stuff. Oh, we can touch on DeFi. Let's do that. <laughs> well, it's an, it's an important thing to talk about. Um, mine's a Bitcoin show, but I have plenty of people listen to it who are uh, crypto well, people well, DeFi, as well. DeFi is important because this cycle, it's been basically the like the catalyst for the, the downfall of the price for every every instrument here, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin or a Cardano or whatever. Like DeFi is the thing that's kind of led the way for destruction, the price destruction. Yeah, well, there's something every cycle. I mean, I think that's the memory of this cycle is going to be the the DeFi contagion. The previous one would have been the ICO. ICOs. How? What was previous to that? Uh, let's see. So ICO Mt. Gox crash. That's yeah. the that's the big one there. Uh, what scams were run then? Uh, there were a lot of token scams. It was token scams again. It was like. Is it colored coins? Were they scams? They didn't call them colored coins, uh, but there were a lot of things like like so in that cycle, there were a bunch of projects, uh, storage, and like other types of projects like that where everything was everything. It was cr- put something on a blockchain. Yes, everything on a blockchain. Everything had to be on a blockchain. Um, it was the like blockchain my business era. So I think that was like Don Tapscott showed up and a bunch of others. It was the books, but that you know. And then before that, maybe it was Mount Cox. Yeah, because the $20,000 rise, like that was like the, the era of the gurus too. Um, I don't know if it was 1000 I don't remember. But like the, the era of the gurus, but like there was all sorts of like, like basically blockchain my business. And a lot of like early on, all of the price destruction was pretty much led by collapsing exchanges, right? So you had uh, like Cripsy and and Mt. Gox and stuff like that. All of the, like always, it was like halted because an exchange would collapse. And it's interesting this time because it's not so much, like this time the price collapse is like a leading indicator of exchange collapses, which was a little different than the last times. Like the, the this time the price collapse caused the exchange collapse. Well, have we, have we had an exchange collapse in this cycle? Voyager, Celsius, I mean. Do you, do you consider those exchanges? I don't consider them exchanges. Uh, I guess, I mean. They're different than like Coinbase, but they're they're exchanges. BlockFi, like these are exchange like. They're at least tangential too, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think Voyager, Voyager was a, an exchange, wasn't it? I consider them. I mean, I can't think of a name for them, but they're borrowing and lending services. I th- I consider them financial services. But Coinbase borrows and lends, right? So like, I thought you could buy and sell on Voyager as well. Yeah, I, I guess what it is is that the primary product on. Coinbase is to exchange, and you can borrow and lend. And I think on a Voyager yes, was the primary product was to buy and lend or a borrow yeah. and lend, and then you could also buy. Yeah, and out of the and look, I know some of these services aren't popular. I know because one of them, one of my sponsors is BlockFi, and I get criticized a lot for having them as a sponsor. Um, <laughs> my first tweet when I heard you advertise for them was, "You're going to regret that one." <laughs> well. I mean, we can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, no, that's fine. That's, we should. You no, know, I've, I've been, I've taken a lot of criticism for it, and recently people have been questioning, you know, why have I not got rid, got rid of them as a sponsor, and like, what's my opinion on it? And uh, I've always been very clear. I look, I use their services, so I use their um, borrowing service, and I would uh, no, their lending service. Which one do I do use? Lending. You you lend. Yeah, they, I lend yeah. and get a, a interest uh, pay, pay, payment back, and I also use. Uh, I would use their borrowing, unfortunately. Yeah, it's not set up in the right way for me. But if I was to buy a house and I had enough Bitcoin to be able to borrow against that to buy pay a mortgage, again, I would consider something like that. Uh, I've had a, a my service them hasn't been uh, interrupted in any way at all, and I'd actually use their card, but the card isn't available in the UK. But uh, they've never paused withdrawals. Nobody's no, ever, no, had, they ever had their funds withheld. They've, they've been the most legitimate. I'm glad Sam well, Bankman Freed led in as well. Yeah, SBF uh, Sam Bankman Freed stepped in and basically. You know, made them solvent, right? Like, their actual their interest rates dropped heavily. People were like, "Well, why would you use them? Their interest rates are so low. You can get five percent here, six percent there." The reason you got low interest rates is they didn't do any exotic weird shit. Uh, they didn't do any, you know, they didn't wrap your Bitcoin. Well, well, they, 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 you know, they made their they made their interest by lending the Bitcoin out to other people. has been screwed twice, right? Uh, in this recent sort of like downfall, I think they've probably learned a lot. But before that, like their interest was heavily contingent on the GBTC premium. Yeah, and I think I think that like as I see these crypto cycles happen, and these tra- these companies that are offering traditional products, I mean, like you can get a credit line against your equities. It's a priority credit line. Get it from Wells Fargo, Fidelity. Like there's all sorts of companies that offer these. 
if you're if you're getting a, a, like it's a legitimate product, credit line, and and you need to you need to be compensated interest wise. But like this is a legitimate product, so like as as these companies fail, as they make mistakes, as they do th- as they watch their competitors fail, I think it becomes very clear where the risks are, and it makes them more resilient. So I mean, like I could see a company like BlockFi coming out of this with an enormous understanding of where they failed and the possibility of actually making a, a, a much more robust lending product and other such. Well, we got more robust exchanges after Mt. Gox. Yeah. And we will get more, it might even not be BlockFi, it might be somebody else, it might be. I mean, Legend. it might be NASDAQ that yeah. like launches. I mean, these, these products, I mean, uh, was it uh, Nidig yeah. has, has a lending product. I don't love a lot of the terms of these lending products. Coinbase has a lending product. Uh, you know, all uh, these lending products, I think, are are dangerous, only because of the volatility of Bitcoin. But I don't think they always have to be. And I I do like, I do like the sort of uh, experiment that we're allowed to do on this. And I, as well as like, I think people got to recognize this is like, I think you have to figure out the CFI stuff, the centralized finance stuff, before we like move into sort of a, the era of DeFi. You have to figure out where CFI plugs into Bitcoin, very specifically. And is Bitcoin gold? If it is, then yeah, like lending against, it's a great idea. But I do, I do want to reiterate that point because you know, I've taken a lot of uh, punches on Twitter for, for it. And you know, why would you have them as a sponsor? And it's why would I not? I use their products. I like their products. You might not. You might think they're bad for people, and you should tell people what you think. But I use it, so why would I not yeah. have it as a sponsor? I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I rejected Celsius. I actually, Mashinsky in Hong Kong, I met him in Hong Kong. He asked to buy out. He wanted to outbid BlockFi and I refused to work with him. I knew their product was shit. I'm not sure if I should be saying this. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, but whatever. Um, but the point is that BlockFi is a product I use and I would use them if they weren't a sponsor. So like, what, like where is my moral requirement? Where is my ethical boundary? Like, yeah, well, I, th- I, think, I think that like as long, I, I mean, I, I tend to say do all things with irony. Um, I think it's a very hard thing. I think people need to shut the fuck up because, like, taking money is a is is a sort of problematic thing to do in all cases for like a journalist, right? Always, especially when like it's a small team. Like, you know where the money comes from. There's not like a back office that does like you know the sales of the ads and then the front office that has no idea what those ads are. Like, you know all of your sponsors. Well, I know all the sponsors yeah. I've turned down as well. Yeah, 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 of course. But like my point is that like it really does, it, it does make it so that like there is, sure, absolutely a bias. But I, I think I think that like if you are putting yourself in a position, like let's say you're advertising things, like I, I get mad at like people like Ben Shapiro. He's, I don't know how many mattresses he's advertised as being his favorite mattress, right? And I think to myself, does that guy have like 14 mattresses stacked on each other? Like I don't like he's got the Helix and he's got like the Casper and he's like they're just stacking on top of each other. At the bottom, each one, yeah, each one's his favorite mattress. Like I really, I am really turned off by that kind of advertising. I think the fact that you are advertising stuff that you're in, um, it doesn't validate it for me. But I I think that people like in this space really need to understand that like there is there is a conflict because, um, and I think about this like investments when I'm when I'm putting money into something in this space. I don't do very many individual investments, but when I do, I feel very reluctant to talk about them because I don't I don't know if eventually it might blow up. And I don't like the idea of like getting people into this thing um, that I'm putting money into, uh, be, you know, getting people to like use it based on my name or anything like that or, or my level of trust. Not, I don't know if I have any, but I do very strongly like want to guard that the little credibility I have in that way. And so I've like been very like careful about talking about that stuff, but like a podcast is very different. And you know, when you run a podcast, I think you're taking money from people and like, it's a little, it can be a little hard to criticize them. I, I think you actually do a pretty good job of like running, uh, willingly taking the criticism. Yeah. Look, th- there is certainly a conflict. Yeah. You know, I am taking products. Can I be openly critical about these companies? Yeah. And then it's like, what is my role in this? Is my role a journalist or an interviewer? If I'm a journalist, should I be investigating these companies? Well, I'm not investigating Celsius or Voyager. I have people on have interviews. Will I talk about my relationship with BlockFi? Sure, I'm happy to talk about it. And you know, they've sponsored the show for plus three years now. Um, we we take our sponsors very seriously. I, you know, I talk through them and Danny is. Yeah, one of our one of our sponsors is a Bitcoin casino. You know, we talked about this. If well, should we be doing this? You know, what about if people lose money on that? So, well, I go to Vegas. I lose money all the time. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, these are free. These aren't scams. They operate within the law, but they are things where you have to understand the trade-offs and the risk. Because you want to have a gamble. I think everybody who gambles knows there's a risk of losing. Yeah, and I think most people these days know with something like BlockFi, you're you're handing over your private keys, oh. and there's a risk. I'll you tell you. I'll for. tell you what I dislike about BlockFi is that, like, again, it's it's in the same space as like everything else in Bitcoin. There is. I do not think that they are compensating you appropriately appropriately for the risk that you're taking on. And I think this market is proving it. Like, I don't know what they're giving now. 3% a year? 2% it, depends, a year. it depends on how much you hold. But yeah, let's say it is that. And yet two weeks ago, they had to be bailed out and nearly went bankrupt. Yeah, but they weren't in a situation where they might have gone bankrupt and not been able to return funds. Okay, their risk was a run on the bank. And what what did they call it? What does he call it? Um it's to do with the time difference. Like they've got your Bitcoin that they hold and the Bitcoin they lend out. Okay, so they yeah, need so they, they need they, they can't call all the loans in and they can't pay you. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So they it's, had it's a li- inventory problem. Yeah, an inventory problem and a liquidity problem, but it's not a problem where they've lost your funds, which appears to be the case with Celsius. It appears to be the case there's actually yes. a black hole, and it doesn't appear yeah, to be yeah. the case. Well, that's the this. thing. Like that's why that's why they were able to find a buyer, right? Sam Bankman Fried stepped in and he was like, "Well, this looks like you know these books balance." Right? Yeah. I'm sure Celsius's books do not balance. And how much stress on the BlockFi system came from the contagion of other things, and maybe they do come out this stronger and we get stronger products from that. I, I, my view on it is, is these are optional products. No one forces you to use it. Correct. And the risks are there, and you should and could be aware of them. I mean, we don't even advertise their yield at the moment. But, but it, you know, it is a tricky one. I, I have thought about this. I've thought about it a lot. I mean, what is our responsibility here? You know, with every one of our sponsors, how much responsibility we have. Yeah, and I don't put I don't put a lot of like I mean like I we think wrestle with it. it. Me and Danny talk about it a lot. I never wrestled with it. Like with Bitcoin Uncensored, the reason we never took any money was because then we never had to wrestle with that question. And the reason we never wanted to wrestle with that question is is this exact same, you know, issue, right? Yeah. You gotta wrestle with it. We never did. Um, we also didn't make any money on Bitcoin Uncensored ever. <laughs> you know, well, like that's that's the thing. Like it was never profitable. We just did it because it was fun. Yeah. So well, we did, but we have seven employees, and you know, we have. Oh, this you had machine. a whole operation. We yeah. we had nothing. It was it was Chris and me, and like just just fucking having fun. It was just a blast, and that's that's what I loved. Uh, that's what I loved about it. It was it was really fun to just like do it, but it was also tedious and uh, arduous, and like you know there was never any money. It was just it was just us just making making content and just having fun. And uh, and I, I do think I do think that that is the difference. Like if you're running this as a business, it's a little different. Like we were able to do something that was a little bit more artistic, a little bit more like uh, journalistic, confusing to everybody, but sort of postmodern journalism. And I think it's very difficult for anybody else to do that. It's just it's an era. It's a different type of thing. And like I think nowadays. People are here to uh, they're they're building something a little different than we were. Well, so uh, there's another thing people have said was like, well, why don't you charge for the content? Why don't you do nobody that? Nobody buys instead? content. Nobody does. Nobody buys content. What, like what? I've been in content for forever. No one buys content. It's not fair to ask. Do you remember? It's when, never fair to do ask. Do you remember when we did? How many subscribers did we have for our content on Patreon? No, not on Patreon. You know when people we had that email list. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the people who paid twelve. Yeah, I think I think it went from yeah. I think maybe fourteen was our top. Fourteen is sixty dollars a year. Yeah, and of them, some of them were like sponsors who had bought boy anyway. Yeah, so fourteen at sixty dollars a year. So that's what's that? Six hundred. People don't buy content. Six, six, eight hundred forty dollars. Yeah. And, and that might change yeah. in the future, but people just don't like it's. It's a very difficult pitch. Yeah. To make people buy content. It's very difficult. Um, I subscribe to some uh, some content. There's a couple of podcasts I subscribe to. Um, I don't know how well they do, but the people won't subscribe to content. So the only model is the advertiser model. And then so, you know, what are the rules? We we have a very, I say we, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to put this on Danny. They're my rules. My rules is, are you a Bitcoin company you, or do you have a Bitcoin product? If you have a Bitcoin product, okay, you're considered. And the second one, will I use it or am I using it? So if you've got a Bitcoin product and I do or will use it, then I'm happy to sponsor you to be a sponsor. I use BlockFi. You know, I use Gemini. I use Casa. You know, if you go through our list of sponsors, I I use I literally use all of them. And so it's very hard for me to say is why would I not accept their sponsorship revenue for a product I would use? Now I've turned down stuff that I won't use or wouldn't use or don't use, and that's fine. And we've turned so, down a lot. So I, we should talk about that because I think that ties yeah. into the DeFi. Yeah. I think I think that was what was interesting to me is in this cycle, in this growth, in this like, you know, now now we're in crypto winter. This is a time to reflect. 
a time to think back on the last year or a few months. And uh, I think I think what was interesting to me was I the, the number of Bitcoiners that I watched get sucked into things that they know are bullshit. Um, the NFT stuff, for example, I I, I you know have story after story of Bitcoiners who came up to people or me or others and were like, I have some NFTs and I love them, you know, and you just kind of sitting there like, you know, programmers, people that know what these things are, they're literally receipts. And I would say to everybody, like, if you want to buy NFTs, I don't care. I don't find them to be scammy. I find them to be beanie babies. They're just collectibles and you're buying a receipt. That's it. It's a very dumb purchase, but right now for some reason there's prestige coming from it. So do it with irony, go forth. But there's a lot of Bitcoiners that were buying NFTs. And I think similarly, there were a lot of Bitcoiners that were enticed by the DeFi pitches. And I saw like Novogratz, right? He's not a Bitcoiner. Novogratz has always had a love for like Ethereum. I think it's because he was brought into the space by Joe Lubin. But he's always had kind of a love for Ethereum and Ethereum type products. He got a tattoo, a goddamn tattoo of Luna. He's got own. a lot of tattoos now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got to cover it up. You know, you've got to like extract from the Luna tattoo. Yes. <laughs> so he got a tattoo about Luna. It's a wolf howling at the moon, you know. And I look at something like that, and I I I, I mean, I, he was not the only one who got enticed. I, I saw Bitcoiners left and right. I knew a guy up in Boca. <laughs> this insane set of text messages. I messaged him uh, the day that Luna depegs. And uh I'll call him John. I guess, John, um, are you still in DeFi? Because like I'd, I'd been having dinners with John for months. And John had been telling me all of the DeFi shit he was in. And I was saying to him every time, like, you're gonna lose all your money. This is hot potato. You don't know when the, you know, you don't know when the music's gonna stop. It's, you know, it's it's just like it's over. You gotta get out. It's good now. Get the fuck out. He's like, oh, it's it's a long ways off. It's a long ways off. You know, we'd we'd have this discussion. It's always a long ways off. Nobody knows like when when the market's gonna explode and no one ever knows when it's going to collapse. And when it collapses, it collapses quick. When it explodes, it explodes quick. It happens all the time here, here in this industry. And I've, I've witnessed it. Like I thought I had more time to buy $7 Bitcoin and then all of a sudden it was 800 bucks. So I, I asked him this. I was like, do you have uh, some DeFi stuff? And he, he messaged me back, oh, nothing, not too much. He's like, just, you know, just the safe stuff like Luna and a few others. And I'm like, oh, I guess he feels comfortable in these things, even though like Luna's clearly depegging weird week or two goes by. I don't see him. Uh, I message him back. Hey, like did, what's going on? He messaged me back. He says, I, I've lost huge amounts. I've lost everything. Like I was on vacation. I hadn't been watching the prices. I didn't know Luna was depegging. And this happened to a lot of people, this kind of thing. I think like people were really very comfortable sitting in their DeFi, not because not because they they knew it wouldn't collapse, but because they really thought that like it had been up for months, it had been up for months, and like this will not be the day. That seems to be like kind of this the, will not be the this day. will not be the day. We've got one more. It's not day. gonna be the day. I'm gonna go on vacation. It won't be this week. I'm on vacation. I'll come back next week. Maybe it'll be next week, and that's the week it, it collapses. And they don't realize how quickly it collapses. Like Bitcoin Tina tells me this joke. Uh, a guy uh, goes into a stockbroker and he's like, "Oh my god!" And there's a thinly traded stock. And he goes, "I, I wanna, I wanna buy this." And he buys it, and the stock price goes up thirty dollars. And he goes, "Oh my god! I just made so much money! I want to buy more." So he buys more, and the price goes up sixty dollars. He's like, "Oh my god! I am so rich! I want to buy more!" And he buys it, and he's, it goes up. It goes up another thirty dollars. He's like, "Oh my god! I this is crazy! Sell it! Sell it all!" And his stockbroker looks at him and says, "Sell to whom?" <laughs> And I think that's, I think that's like where everyone got caught, is they didn't realize that they were playing uh, merry-go-round. They didn't, they were playing like Ponzi, you know, some sort of Ponzi game, and it ends at some point, and they don't know that like you'd never know when that's going to happen, and when it does, it's quick.